everyone, and in today's video we're going over part one of the Enchanted Rose Bustle Gown. And I think I've been talking about this dress in the last three videos, probably. It seemed like it was just um, something always kept coming up that kind of put it on this back burner, which I hated. Now, part one, we will be going over drapery and basically how I did my trim for both the drapery and the underskirt. I, I'm not going to be going into full detail on the underskirt because I've already done a video on the Truly Victorian Four Gore underskirt pattern, which I'll link below, of course. Um, the only difference that I did was in that video, I did not flatline the skirt because I didn't feel the need to, but this time I decided to flatline my underskirt, which I will get into some great tips on flatlining later when I do the drapery. Uh, Really, the only reason I went and flatlined this skirt is because you don't necessarily need to when you are working with cotton, because cotton usually is about me me bleh, medium weight. So it's not that big of a deal to flatline it. It is a good idea if you're using something like a lightweight silk. Um, but the reason I did it is because, as you can see here, I decided I wanted to have invisible hem and it was a great way to get the invisible hem and also uh, later when I did the trims on it I go over and show you guys how I invisibly sew in the trimming details too so it doesn't make anything noticeable on the outside and to me it just looks a little tidier and was worth having the extra work of flatlining to make things invisible. <laughs> uh, but yeah, basically the reason I did uh, the invisible hem is very straightforward as you saw in the clip. I just was sewing the, I hemmed it up and I just caught in the flat lining instead of going all the way through to the outer fabric. So one, that's definitely one of my favorite reasons to flat line is because you can do stuff like that so that it doesn't show over. Is it a more work because I had to hand sew the hem? Yes. Is it worth it to me? Yes, it was. <laughs> Uh, I really don't have much else to say in this intro because I just wanted to kind of go over the differences I did with the underskirt. But yeah, uh, this video will mostly be focusing on the drapery and in part two we will talk about the bodice and all the adjustments and trimmings in that section. But right now, let's get sewing some drapery. So here's our main fabric. I absolutely think it's so beautiful. I think the red really pops in the roses. Um, and yes, uh, this is going to be mostly our drapery and uh, depending how much I have left, I will be using it also for the main part of the jacket, if not all of it. The secondary fabric is I decided to just go with this kind of dark matching dark green. I matched it as best as I could to the background of the rose fabric. This is what our four gore skirt is and will be like also potentially contrast parts of the bodice. I still kind of playing around with what the idea is for the bodice, like which base I want to go with, but yes. All right, we've already discussed our four gore skirt, so now it's time to get to the drapery, which is made out of our lovely rose fabric. And again, I will be going with a truly Victorian pattern, and we're doing the 1886 bordered asymmetrical overskirt. I will not be making any alterations to this pattern. I like the way it looks, and I want to keep it simple because uh, my other project is just turning into a nightmare, so I wanted a simple dress. So yeah, um, basically our first step is going to be cutting everything out and then I'll, as usual, kind of go over the steps. Not super in detail, but enough that if there's any complicated parts, maybe it'll help you guys if you are also working on the same pattern. All right, let's just jump into it, I guess. I literally just wanted to show you guys just how big one drapery piece is. It's enormous. 
So what I've had to do, since this is not very wide fabric at all, because it is kind of older fabric, I think it's only like 44 if I'm lucky, honestly. So I opened it up, and with this piece, I own, thank goodness, I only need one. <laughs> so I don't have to have it on the fold, so it's, this is not double, the fabric's not double folded. But yes, I just wanted to show you guys what I meant by just how enormous these get. And of course, all these markings here are pleats and such, but we'll get into that later. <laughs> um, yeah, let's start cutting. Okay, so where were those instructions? <laughs> I already lost them. Okay, um, so the... I think I accidentally miss said before uh, that big piece I showed you guys completely on the ground. That's the front piece, and that is a solid piece. The back piece honestly just looks like a big square, but it is meant to be on, cut on the fold. And that's why you should really read your pattern piece, because I uh, almost didn't do that, and now I've got to fix a little boo-boo I made. Oh well. What is rather sad is I'm only left with 40 inches of this, and I'm like... I really, really wanted to have the majority of my bodice made out of this fabric. I'm still hoping that maybe I can get away with it, especially if I go with like the, um, oh, what's it called? Uh, the contrast, yeah, the contrast bodice where it's like the vest will be the green and then hopefully I can make the rest out of this. We'll have to wait and see because that is literally the last part of the outfit that we'll make. But we'll put that to the side to also save on the nice fabric for my overskirt band. I just went with the green because your bodice will cover your bands and if I run out of this fabric it's easier to get <laughs> uh, which I don't think I will run out of it I've already used the majority of what it was for which is a four core skirt and there's quite a bit left so um the only thing is so looking at this pattern uh now I love that cotton and everything and really this is the problem with all cottons but it is lightweight so I'm gonna have to flatline it just like I flatlined the foregore skirt which like I said in a way I don't really hate that I, I think this one might be a pain though because this that front piece is so big I'm hoping it goes well but usually when you start getting into those really big pieces and flatlining it's never fun <laughs> because the best way to flatline is just like getting it on a nice big cutting board, which I have a really big one, my minus 50 inches, um, and just like pressing out the fabric, but this is so big, I am a little worried about flatlining it, but I really need to because the inside of that print fabric is not nice looking. It's that the typical cotton print look where it's just the muted white version. I don't know if I will flatline the back piece. Just looking at the pattern, I don't, I guess I will, I will. You know, just to be professional, right? To be professional. And then too, like, if a big gust of wind comes and blows all my draperies everywhere, hopefully it won't be like that one scene in the Gilded Age, which really annoyed me. I don't even know why it annoyed me. I think because it was just like, Essentially the scene she's wearing a pink dress or a yellow dress. I can't remember. It's the main character Marion and like she turns around and this big gust of wind just goes With all of her drapery parts and I'm just like They're not flat tied So I'm not gonna be that girl that criticizes the show For not doing something and then I don't do it because I'm lazy. So I'm not gonna be that girl I'm not gonna be that girl we're going to flatline everything, uh, just like the Foragor skirt though, I'm just going to go with black. I'll see if I have enough of the green for the front, uh, just because that would be the more important one to kind of have a matching green, but I do not think I will have enough of the green to do the front, we'll see. Uh, but I'll probably just go with black because... Alright, the first part to flatlining is we're going to press both our fabrics, the um, lining and the fashion. I start with the lining first so I can get it laid out nice and flat on the floor and then put my fashion on top of that once it's pressed. But yes, this is very essential. So 
Um, as you may notice, I did not have enough green for the front piece. Alright, let's get ironing. Okay, so, yeah, let's start flatlining. So I've done my best to press everything out. The green fabric pressed better than the black, just for many reasons, but yeah. Now, what I'm going to do is sandwich them together. I like to start at the top because I feel that's the most important part to look nice because we got to do a lot of pleating, uh, tucks, or whatever. Um, and I'm going to zoom out in a minute to show kind of how I'm going to do it, but... Essentially, I'm going to go along and press everything as flat as I can and go along the edges with my Wonder Clips, which I prefer to do that than anything else. I just find it holds it tauter and they're easier for me to use instead of stuff like... You can certainly use like basting pens or whatever, but... Yeah. And I may end up doing that because this is so big. Uh, but I'm hoping I won't have to because it is a little different from quilting, so... Yeah, um, let's get you guys in a better position to watch me attempt this. <laughs> All that hard work, and now my cats think it's a bed to have a bath on. So, yep, I'm probably gonna have to reflatten everything. <laughs> So here's that nerve-wracking part where we turn it on the other side and look, uh, there are, as you can see, just slight bubblings going on. Uh, I, I'm never going to make it perfect, honestly, like, I don't know if I can <laughs> with such a big piece, but this isn't going to cause a huge problem for us in the future. Um, I mean, if it was like really bad, yeah, you'd have to unpick some of your basting stitches, which is why we based it and basically fix it, but it's really not that bad. Um, and as you can see, like some of it's just cause it's not stretched out, but yeah, um, there's not any huge, huge bubbles. So, and the front looks fantastic. That's the important front, that the front looks fantastic. So, um, yeah. And some of this might even just be because I haven't, I just laid it out. I didn't press it down super good, but. I've done the best I can, everyone, okay? <laughs> okay, so I've gotten the front and back uh, cut. Oh, that's terrible, the camera works, sorry. And here we are. Uh, this is We're gonna start with the front piece as per the instructions. Um, it's actually under there, but everything's been flatlined. I know I didn't go over it with the back piece, which is hanging up there on my naked dress form. <laughs> so the first step is pretty basic. We're going to be making a small hem on the right side. The right side is this side though, so when you're looking at the pattern it's actually your left, but it'll be your right side when you're wearing it. And I was a little concerned that maybe I was reading that wrong at first, but then step two talks about pleating the left hand side, which is on section A2, which as you can see up here is that. So that kind of helps us decipher what is left and right, because Yes, yeah, so it can get confusing. So I'm gonna go ahead and hem up, right for my fingers, this part here. Just hem that up real quick, and then we'll go into step two, and I'll go into further details about the pleating, or showing it at least. I, I mean, the pattern is fairly straightforward, like it shows the pleating line, so I'm probably not gonna do too much chalking. I'm just gonna show you guys 
me doing it. <laughs> um, and I'll check back in a minute. Okay, it's looking really snazzy. Look at those pleats. Ooh, they are pretty big, so don't be like intimidated by that. Um, I haven't even pressed them, and they're already looking really nice and crisp. Obviously, I'll probably need to go and press them at some point to make them more sturdy. Um, so for the hem, which was the first part, I went and did a, a rolled hem. I don't know how well the camera's picking that up, though. Just because I didn't want to just... I, ha I didn't I didn't want any raw edge at all um, I could have done invisible hem stitch on it but I'm just like meh <laughs> it's not that big of a deal um, right now because I don't know where that's gonna be on the dress like on the drapery over skirt so I'm like it may be to that point that it's so not noticeable like because the only thing about this over skirt, like looking at the picture, I'm like a little confused if maybe the picture's backwards, so I don't know. But look at that, we're already sort of halfway done with the front. I'm just kidding, because uh, the, there's five steps and we've already done two, but the third one is gonna be a doozy. So fold the fan pleats marked with dots. So that's on this side that we hemmed. By matching all the dots together to the same point allow these pleats to fall into a fan shape you should no longer have a corner but one long straight edge between the right and left pleated sections base the pleats together at the dots only the rest of the pleats should hang free so she does put a very nice picture kind of showing what so this is what the inside should look like and this is what the outside should look like. So, this is the part in truth that has been kind of making me feel a little intimidated. So if we can get through this, I think the rest will go really nice and smooth. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and grab the pattern piece so I can mark everything like I did with these. I didn't know if the camera picked that up, but I basically just, you can sort of see the white marks. It's just white pencil marks that I can get rid of. Um, and I'll do that to mark, I guess, the dots and whatever needs to be marked. Um, I will be filming that whole process because, yes, I think it's a little confusing. <laughs> I say that and then I'm like, oh, I'm just kidding because the Bruno pleat is new to me too. But we'll get to that in a minute. Let's get this fan pleating done. Okay, so I've marked my dots. Uh, they're a bit hard to see. You can see like one there. There's five. Basically the top one is at the very top and the bottom one is down there just before the curve hits. So to my understanding, I'm gonna basically just bring each dot up until all of them connect at the very top together to make this uh, image right here. So that's what I'm going to do, and we'll see if it works. Okay, so I'm just showing you a little bit. <laughs> I'm just showing you guys the underside because you can see I just pasted literally just where this little tiny dot was so I could catch all the pleats. Now if we look at the picture, 
it does look reminiscent of what she had on the back side and the front. Now, it's a bit hard to see because it's flat, but essentially what it should do is like fan out kind of like that. Um, I think I got it right. It looks good. Um, she did say that the instructions are like, yeah, then we should just have a long straight edge between the right and left pleated sections, which is basically this, because uh, at the top it was a bit curved and now it does look very straight. So, all right, uh, hard part one is done, which is the fan pleats. Uh, the next hard part's on the back. I'll concern myself with that later. <laughs> um, uh, essentially, now we are on to step four, which is fold the remaining front pleats as marked per size on pattern, baste all pleats in place, and then we'll be setting this piece aside. So yeah, um, those are basically on the same side as fan pleats, they're just further down again, the pattern indicates it, and I will film, film pinning it, probably not basting it though, and then we'll jump to the back. I do hope I'm doing this right. Um, it just seems like a lot of bulk, but whatever. Um, so here's my pleats, but up here are my flamp, uh, fan pleats. And I just, just want to talk about it because this top one's very close to that fan pleat when you're basting them. I've pulled my fan, because they're going to want to sit like under it, and yeah, don't do that. I've pulled my, basically I've made sure that there's a split so that I don't catch any of those fan pleats when I go to baste it. So that's what I'm going to do now. And we'll move on to the back. It took me a little bit to understand. I had to think about it for a minute, but I got it and I, it's very clever. So, and I will demonstrate it in a minute, but I actually just wanted to talk about it. <laughs> Basically what you're doing is a normal pleat, you know, you would sew three layers essentially of fabric. So say this was a normal pleat, I would have that top layer and then this layer and then the bottom layer that tucked under and everything. But with a Brno pleat, what you do, Brno's, I gotta look up how to properly say that. What you do is, so I, this is where it showed, no wait, sorry. <laughs> so this corner here, I brought to the, that edge square, and I took away the top piece and only sewed two layers together. Like I said, I will be demonstrating this in a minute because I feel like I thought it would be clearer if I talked it out with you guys, but now I'm like, maybe I'm making it more confusing. But it does look like our picture, because you can see, with the two done, it looks like you have this diamond thing going on. And then on the outside, I, I, I guess you poke them out afterwards, and then you have some nice detached Brunos pleats that will kind of be like this. Which answers my question because when I had read up about them originally, I always wondered how the top was not a raw edge. Because I thought you essentially, what I originally thought was that you like, so this was, we'll just take this straight edge. I thought what it meant is that you did it on the outside and just pinned it right there and had this loose part as a burdo pleat, which almost right except in, instead of doing it that way you do it right sides together and you sew the whole the sole the whole part up and then you flip it out and then you have it so it's not a raw edge on the inside so once I figured it out so not as hard as I thought it was gonna be I was like <sighs> like anxiety attacking over it um, if me talking about it wasn't very helpful to you guys, I am going to show you the other side doing it and actually doing it in practice. So you're like, ah, because if you're like me, you're probably a visual learner. I don't know why I said probably a visual learner, but you know, just, I, I need to stop talking. Let's just, let's get back to the sewing. Okay, I hope this is a good angle for you guys. So, um, since it's so big, so basically my pin for the start of the pleat is here and I'm going to take this, this is just my mark pin, and I'm going to take it all the way to the corner 
about a half an inch away and I'm going to take that pin and do this and like I said with a regular pleat I would sew along the whole three layers and that would be your regular pleat but with this I'm now just going to sew from that pin all the way to this corner here that's not on camera so just like this and that's how you make your Bruno pleat I hope now talking about it and showing it to you guys that this helps you guys kind of figure it out too because this like I said this was definitely a huge hurdle for me in like making my own draperies because I'm just like I don't get it <laughs> as she said with the burn house please we'll end up with these pocket areas which is there and there and basically it makes the three sides of the back piece into one long straight piece which it is straight it's just because my curves all like crumpling up and like tugging on it so let's go look at the next step uh, I think my lighting's kind of bad but that's life <laughs> uh, so we were apparently done with the back piece and now we're kind of getting to those finishing steps which is the waistband which is apparently a whopping seven steps more than anything else uh, just a real quick chat so I've gone and appended everything seems to be fitting without having to ease anything again I do want to just point out about the fan pleats make sure you're not going to catch them in your waistband that's why they're not you know there's this gap here sort of so so I got the back sewn on can we just admire the amount of ridiculous pleating I just had to do which is in the instructions uh, it even warns you basically be prepared there is lots of fabric between the two Bernos pleats. This was really hard. These ones on the outside weren't too hard, but oh my gosh. I just hope it looks good. I've done my best. Um, there's not really too much more to deviate. As far as the instructions go, we're going to finish. We're pretty close to the end. Finish waistband by turning all edges under a half inch. And again, in half, top stitch in place. So I'll be doing that. And then I'm going to not do hooks, but I'll be doing buttons. Now with step seven, that's basically hand basting stuff. I may or may not do this. This will basically be the step I'm going to catch up with you guys again, because once I get all this done, I'm gonna throw everything on the dress form, the four gore skirt, well, my bustle, my petticoat, my four gore skirt, and then this drapery. We're gonna see if it needs basting. If it doesn't, then we can get to the really fun part, which is adding all the fun trims. But we'll talk about that in a second. As you can see, I successfully got the drapery all in the waistband. Uh, this blue up here is actually my mock-up for my bodice because I needed to know roughly where the bodice hemline was going to hit on the dress, uh, the drapery part. So for trimming purposes, we'll talk about that in two seconds. Uh, I did have slight concerns uh, because the drapery was so chunky monkey at the waistband. I was like... This is going to be too bulky, but looking too at the bodice because of the way everything's positioned, like the way the bodice is built, I don't think you are going to see it, so awesome. And that's with me even flatlining the drapery, which I guess a lot of people suggested not doing. Oopsies! <laughs> I'm glad I did it personally, but to each their own. And let's kind of get a 360 look at her. Very nice, and this is that a truly Victorian asymmetrical drapery sk over skirt. This has got to be the weirdest thing I've ever filmed. So in case my image doesn't come out clear, here's what it looks like on the phone. And then, see these are the bows that I'm talking about. As you can see, I might just do two. I don't know. I'll have to see how the top one goes. So, it actually looks like they're cut, like, in a swoop, not just, like, direct. So, that's probably how I'm going to cut them. It's swooping the fabric in a curve.
Okay, so I didn't realize that my battery cut off um, and I did not get the photo of me cutting this. So I'll just have to show you guys what I cut for the bow parts of the trim. Essentially, two pieces that are just basically a big rectangle. Mine measure about 12 and a half by roughly six and a half. And this is just gonna be your personal preference about how wide you want your bow. Uh, then you only need one piece that's gonna be a little rectangle. Mine is essentially four by five and a half. That is the knot. Then you're gonna need four or two pairs of a piece like this, which essentially at the longest point is one is about 11 and at the shortest point is about nine and a half. That's just personal, no preference. Again, a good width though is usually about four to four and a half. Mine's at four and a half. So just to quickly go over the sewing because we are really gonna have a super long video here. I'm gonna basically do this bow like a, a pillow bow, which is a little different from how I do my hair bows, but that's fine. I'm just gonna start sewing here. So all the way around. <laughs> And then I'll have a little gap, flip it right side out, top stitch that, because it won't matter if you do it in the middle, since your little knot's gonna cover that up. With these pieces, you just start from the top, go all the way down, as such, trim, flip side, right side out, pleat at the top, and attach them together. And uh, then I'll show you guys how to do, uh, do the bow knot. But as you're sewing wise, the bow knot just gets sewed like a little hot dog. Little hot dog, flip right side out. Once I get all that sewn, I'll show you guys how to put them together and then how to attach them to the sways. So for the trim now on the four gore skirt, I'm going to be referring to my Bustle Fashions 1885 through 1887 book by Francis Grimble. And in this book, in the back section, they have lovely suggestions for trims, which she compiled from different magazines of the era and everything. Um, and the one I want to do is actually this one here, which comes from a September 1884 edition of the Delineator. I don't, Delineator? I don't actually know how to say that magazine, but it's really cool. Basically, it's a sheared finish for skirt or drapery. We're going to be, of course, using it for our four core skirt, and I'm going to literally just uh, sh do the shearing or ruching, I guess, maybe. And it talks about it actually up above it. Um, figure nine shows a charming decoration for skirts or draperies in thin silks, mulls, etc. I'm going to use it in cotton. I don't care. A foot trimming is, of course, added to the foundation. Skirt shearings are made perpendicular at intervals of four or five inches in the edges. I may not make them that close. I haven't decided. And they're drawn up to form the series of no. And then a lace ruffle is sewn underneath, and that's literally what I'm going to do for the four gore skirt. So I'm going to go ahead, we'll move over to look at the skirt, and I'm going to start with the shearing part, and then I will do the lace underneath. 